Hi friends, welcome to yet another episode of Stoic Talks. Now in this episode, we bring you a conversation with Rohit Chauhan of RC Funds. Now there was a time in early 2000s when we didn't have too many investment bloggers as we have today. I remember reading some of the early blogs and that's how I managed to get introduced to Rohit's work. Uh, I have followed his writings ever since and consider him to be one of the original thinkers in the field of investing. I also think that he is a good inspiration for those individuals who believe that you know investing cannot be successfully pursued with other full-time engagements. Now, what I like about Rohit is that he doesn't take any investment wisdom for granted and will caution the prevalent thought process. And as a result, he has continuously evolved as a value investor. Today, me and Manish will attempt to capture this evolution. And we get into a detailed conversation on the investment process of Rohit. At the request of Rohit, we are going to keep his video hidden, but that doesn't take away anything from the learnings that you can capture from this conversation. Hope you enjoy this. Let's jump in. Hey Rohit, welcome to Stoic Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys. Rohit, how are you? I'm doing great. How about so, both of you? All good. Great. All good. great. So, you know, I came to know about Rohit from a friend uh, named Varanya, who was, is a subscriber of his investment advisory. And he was all praise. And so I made a mental note back then that someday I would like to know more about him and probably profile him in our podcast series if we restarted. And now that we have restarted it, and so here we are. Uh, Rohit, let's start with understanding your style drift. Now, we know that you're a value investor, but within that, there are so many distinctions. So what exactly do you do? So I uh, started with... Uh with value investing way back when, uh, I mean, it used to be called value investing. Then I started in like mid nineties. Right. Uh, and at that point, uh, the way it started was that as you know, as most of uh, value investors have kind of stumbled into it, uh, started with, you know, came across this, uh, book by about Warren Buffett. Right. And, and those days, you know, he was not the God. He was a, he was a, a God, you know, value investing God in the U S but not known in India. So that's where, where I started. And usually when you start and you have an engineering background and a quantitative trend of mind, uh, I mean, trend, a kind of mind, uh, that's where you start off. So it was whatever, you know, he was preaching quality at a, at a certain price, do your DCF and this and that, that's how I started. And then it has been more opportunistic. So let's say, you know, come to 2003, 2010 kind of time frame, and you could buy quality at a reasonable price. You could, uh, you know, companies like a nation paints or a pity light at 15, 17 times earnings. So that's, it's been very opportunistic. And then you get the 2008 and 2010, 2008 crash and things are available on the cheap. And these were, these were available for less than cash. But off late, and you know, thanks to thanks to quite a bit on your on your uh, website also, started looking at not necessarily that I invest based on that, but I started looking at momentum, and started looking at technical analysis and all the other. So the thing which kind of um, hit me was that A is obviously there are other approaches of investing which do equally well. So there is value in all 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 approaches. But second was the amount of time which you know each of these other approaches spent. Right. So let's say momentum. Right. If you look at the 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 basic basic philosophy, forget about how it is done and you know how what are the returns. But the amount of time, at least just my at least the quantitative part, the time amount of time which you spend in coming up with a portfolio and the returns you get is the return on that time is disproportionately high versus somebody doing value investing. Right. You you reading books, reaching out to management, doing this, that, that, it's weeks and months of effort, but the returns are not commens often are not very commensurate. So it's a very artisanal way of doing it. So again, uh, started off as a value investor and that's how my blog and everything is, but I'm not, you know, I, I don't, I don't now put myself in that box. My thought process is, you know, look at what works rather than getting, you know, too religious about something and too touchy about one a specific approach. You said your return to reward, also oh, your effort to reward ratio 
was skewed a bit and you realize that it's much higher if you do the other parts of things right so so uh when you're looking at that let's actually before that let's bring a chronology to this whole transition also right um just for the benefit of users i mean you know you uh, benefit of the listeners you have already mentioned it multiple times in your various interviews but what was the year when you actually started investing again it's it, it's usually never a, a bright line right but uh, i would say 97 97 98 so i am i'm ancient i'm ancient by most standards 97 98 and the and the you know maybe some of your listeners may have maybe toddlers at that time so you can <laughs> <laughs> you can guess my age yeah 97 98 economic times just the start of the internet you can call yeah. it and so if i'm I correct in reading this and what i have seen on your blog also you started more towards arbitrage risk arbitrage primarily special situations that was one part of your investment profile <laughs> so to speak obviously besides the normal value investing so is it fair to assume that you were more towards grahamian kind of investing or the other part was more towards value uh, at reasonable price which is warren buffett's way of doing things and the other was special situation so how what was the mix in the initial initial part of your career actually i have been all over the place so i started core has always been the buffett style or was always the buffett style of investing the others you know it's always been uh, to explore all possible you know all possible uh, op- uh, you know opportunities if you may so i was looking at uh, uh, special situations i was looking at graham type of uh, I- uh, you know uh, ideas special bargains uh, yeah no no at, at that point of time quantitative or again this is a bias which i have seen i saw i, I realized in myself and i've seen in a lot of other in- value investors is they almost take value investing as a religion and say trading is not good you know i should stay away from momentum i should stay away uh, i find it you know I, i mean i don't find it you know uh, smart to do it that way so right from the early point started with a gram because that kind of you know uh, was was very natural to me and i think that's that that was very important i was comfortable sleeping at night with that started a little bit of special situations but i just dabbled a very little bit here and there uh, on it you did not go beyond that because the amount of time and uh, this mind you this is while i'm doing my full time work so the amount of time and effort one has to put in special situations in all kind of stuff is uh, is far more in terms of the versus the return so i've always been a proponent i've worked backwards i have so much time what can i do what is the best i can do with the limited time which i have so uh, the special situations bit of it the same thing around graham yeah maybe i can make a return but it's way too much work uh, you know you find you find uh, pretty crappy companies somehow you know buy a, a boatload of it and hope some of them work makes your stomach churn every every quarter when you go through their conference calls and their annual reports and everything and then hopefully a few of them will work out so that was way too much uh, you know i used to think of it like the like the cow method right you you eat a whole lot of load of grass and then maybe a little bit of milk comes out of it <laughs> not my cup of tea so i kind of gave up all of that stuff over time it it's just a natural way of exploring stuff reading you know figuring out what's happening and then trying it out and then some some sticks and then some just falls off so that's been the the approach no no grand approach or a, or a, any any major thought process that this is this is the 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 road i should travel it's just you know exploring stuff figuring stuff out and then dropping what does not resonate with me so uh, essentially rohit you say that your current style drift can be termed as opportunistic is it core remains the the core remains the value approach but then i try to look at all other approaches and kind of step back and think of the mindset behind it so let's say for example how- yeah go ahead Please. yeah i i think you're answering it already uh, i wanted to ask uh, how are you aligning all these uh, things together right so it's still work in progress so for example when i look at momentum uh, the first thing which comes to my mind or kind of if i if i look at it coming from a and a value investors vantage point is that uh, there is uh, so couple of a couple of quick things which which kind of uh, are coming to my mind one is the concept of whole concept of business momentum 
so there is definitely some business momentum which is happening now it could be business momentum it could be some kind of behavioral momentum again lot as i read through the books i realized a lot of academics trying to trying to dissect it i kind of just got went beyond that you know forget about why it is happening at least let me understand what is happening so could see okay there is a concept of business momentum and then there is a, a behavioral momentum uh, so again how does that play when you are when you are investing and a lot of times uh, value investors like me will ignore that will say let me just uh, buy a stock which is cheap and then you know keep my fingers crossed and will all work out but if for example there is no momentum behind it then you could be waiting for a long time second was very simple a very simple you know formula and then one study which kind of really hit me sometime back and i don't remember where i found it was that someone had did some analysis some professor did some analysis for the last 25 years in india and found that momentum strategies had outperformed value and everything like seven or eight basis points or maybe or not 800 basis points per annum for the last 25 years so that like that really hit me if a such a simple strategy is outperforming all the other work which you are doing pure logic says that economy of effort right if you if if you can get so much and so it kind of then led me to looking at more at quantitative uh, kind of investing and what variables right so now the way now i think of of some of this is can i use these quantitative filters to at least filter down stocks right in the end it's all about getting the odds in my favor now again i may not go with momentum because momentum requires a different mindset requires a higher churn you need to know when to get off the train and all that but at least i need to be aware of what all other investors are thinking when i am looking at a company and if i have it in my portfolio and i see it go bonkers in terms of price at least i should know what how the other participants are looking at it so that kind of helps me inform my buy or sell decision so again same thing i have looked at traders okay what is the mindset which traders being right and i think the number one mindset i have found is that traders have an exceptionally good mindset around our risk management value investors are like let's let's and again i know i am i am kind of crapping on value investors and there's a lot of good i am a so being a kind of a a, a lifelong value investor i think i get the privilege to to kind of you know criticize it because i still practice it right but then there is there is value in you know no pun intended but there is value in learning about or at least understanding the mindset so value invest for example traders have a have a very great mindset around uh, uh, risk management constantly thinking about risk i have been very you know i have been uh, in a way guilty of not looking at risk as closely from a, uh, when i'm when i'm doing long term you know it's always buy and hold and pray and it will all work out so you know that's that's the drift i have been now i have been moving in that direction again uh, had a few major uh, failures in my own portfolio in the last 3 years and that kind of pushed me in that direction that you know let me there is a a blind spot so let me let me explore the blind spot why am i not able to figure some of these things out uh, using the you know the the whatever mental models or mindset from a value standpoint so so it's always that if something doesn't make sense okay try to figure out why that's not so rohit uh, i would like to delve a little deeper on this topic if you don't mind sure, because sure. usually mixing value and momentum is lot uh, it's easier said than done uh, can we bring home the point by probably giving a couple of live examples as to where you've been able to align it successfully say yeah buying based on value and riding based on momentum or whatever your strategy is right yeah yeah so the way i used to so i'll step back the way i used to do it earlier was let's say i i pick a company so i'll i'll take an example and again it you know this the usual disclaimers it used to be part of our advisory and hopefully whoever is listening to it you know understands that this is just for you know um, for uh, discussion purposes Education. yeah right so uh, you know uh, iex last year iex uh, you know used to be uh, i mean it's it's a it's a great company it's a power exchange i hopefully you know all listeners know about it but it's a power exchange uh, one of the number one power exchanges in india so this was a company which i i was I, I, again my way of looking for ideas is not to just run filters is to just look around something maybe you would even tweet in your uh, in your twitter or somebody anybody tweets about any company i look at it so i looked at it and at that point of time 
the you know the company was maybe selling at 30 40 times earning or something like that but had a lot of business momentum behind it right the the post covid a lot of uh, you know industry was coming back power consumption was rising and these guys were reporting you know exceptionally good results because of uh, operating leverage and because of some amount of business momentum now in the past if i was just looking at it from a value lens what i would have done is said this is 50 times earnings uh, a complete no no because it it violates some some preconceived notion of how much the valuation should be and i would have ignored it but this time at least now what i've started doing is that okay there is more than just looking at valuations and making decisions around that it has its own purpose and its place but not in this case so looked at iex felt there was business momentum behind it I was doing well so I, i i i i started a position for myself and again for my subscribers now after that the stock goes into a different orbit it just it just took off in more than like in, in a few weeks time itself and uh, again manish i i follow you on twitter and keep looking at what you guys talk about momentum and then when i start looking all around i i know of a few a few other folks who do momentum and it started appearing in the momentum portfolios so i just started appearing the stock stock started taking off it went from 50 60 and at one point i think it 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 hit some uh, maybe 100 times earnings or some some very crazy valuations at the peak so in the past what would i have done is i would have gotten nervous and i have gotten nervous very quickly and i would jump off saying okay this is at the higher threshold of valuation just just get off this time i said let me think about it both from a momentum and a traders uh, mindset keep a again i don't use stop losses but at least mentally i need to start thinking in terms of stop losses start thinking in that okay, at what point should i get off so instead of maybe looking at it once a week month or year or something like that this then got got into a very you know a very kind of a, a close watch kind of a situation and then as traders say right it went into a a climactic blow off right it just it just took off and at that point i still remember uh, some of the books which i have read is that at some point all the news will be great everybody will be just completely thrilled there is you know you would you would always see all you know everything great ahead so i did a a reverse kind of a dcf which is again what value investors do and did some did some reverse calculation i realized that market is is now if you look at it from a fundamental standpoint the market seems to be valuing this company for like 2030 or 2035 or some some god for second you know horizon so at that time you know i felt now this is completely in momentum and the risk reward ratio has become extremely uh, you know it's, it's 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 not favorable so at that point of time i started exiting so in the past i would have never looked at the company a and i would have never gone ahead with it but now you know at the beginning it up it was on the threshold of um, good comp- company at a slightly higher valuation with a time horizon of let's say it will work out in 2 to 3 years but then momentum gives you that pop you know it it suddenly took off and at that at, at that point of time just hold on knowing that it's now not under the control of uh, value investors maybe it's it's the momentum guys who are running with it and you know, nothing good nothing bad or good about any of these things right it's it, it is the way it is so just stuck on with it and luckily this was one of those ones where i used momentum on my on the plus side uh, in a in a in a reverse case i i you know i've spoken about this on on a different uh, uh, forum but uh, another position we held was sequent and uh, all roughly around the same time but i ignored this it took off in the same way and i again got stuck in the narrative and then as the numbers turned the the stock crashed hard so So yeah, uh, may makes a lot of sense to have these viewpoints so that you know what is influencing the stock at different stages. Rohit, let me try to give a different uh, structure or framework to what you mm-hmm. just said, <clears throat> because what you just said sounds to me not momentum or right. use of momentum, but right, more right. it sounds more that you are comfortable with the business. Right. might not be comfortable with the valuation front but you are comfortable right. with the business so that is the first right. standpoint you're not right. chasing any stock which is moving you're saying okay business wise i'm comfortable that is your starting right. point right. and then you're saying okay let me not get bogged down too much with the valuation number uh, if it is not crazy 
but it fits Correct. in the reasonable range but since i can't define reasonable uh I, i don't want to have very stringent parameters which right. sounds very similar to what majority of you know people who uh, people who talk about quality premiums and there is no good right, quality right. premium number and you can if you buy a great business you will always end up making money uh, right. uh, uh, uh that part of thinking is looking more towards in that iex story at least which i could see so are you saying that if the business momentum would not have been continuing but the price momentum would have continued you would have still kept your position on is that am i reading that correctly because then you are playing momentum also parallelly i'll kind of break it down in this way earlier uh, i had just only vaguely heard about momentum i was not even i was you know i had not even read about it i did not even try to understand it well enough so the first step was w- what is momentum all about understand how momentum investors operate read a few books about it so at least that was the first thing at least be aware of the, the you know the rest of the universe of how things operate so that was one part of it second is uh, again in this scenario uh, it the stock already was beyond my normal range of comfort but as you were saying right it wasn't that higher end where it is uh, where it is it is getting into that kind of momentum now in the past what would have happened is that as soon as it hits uh, a certain upper range i would get off the train because a i did not understand i you know it was a blind spot completely i would not understand momentum at all and trading was a quote unquote a bad word for me which is which is which is a wrong way of looking at it hopefully you know smarter later than never right so, uh, so and then at a certain point of time i realized okay this stock is now not a value stock it's a momentum stock and how do you know typically again you know you'll have to pardon me if i don't get the specifics right but how does momentum operate right it would it would be let's say it's a there's a fade beyond let's say 9 months duration right if you if you want to hold a momentum stock you don't want the the best window is uh, i think look back periods are let's say 15 months so the best period is let's say 6 to 15 months or something like that so kind of looked at that mindset and said if it's moving into that momentum phase let me just hold on it and and at the end of the day you're making money whether you make it through momentum value whatever it is right it's not like you know we're doing some some major surgery or something so so at that point of time it's just a matter of changing my thought process around the company saying okay this is not about the the business fundamentals no uh, because it's a, it, all this happened within like 3 to 6 months the the fundamentals did not change as much during that period it was doing well continue to do well and still doing fine just that just a few let's say quarters of 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 base effect because obviously you know this is mid 2021 so the base effect was coming in right if you compare it with one year back the numbers were much better because 2020 was the lockdown period so numbers were good but it it you know it it got into this whole momentum uh, uh, flow and uh, using that lens at least you know i was able to hold it for let's say uh, a couple of more months and and exit at the right time and then i ignored that in sequent see that's the other thing sequent went into that into that into that mode and i kept thinking about it i'm thinking from a 3 to 5 year standpoint and what i did not realize is that once it moves into momentum a small a small pin can really prick the uh, the balloon right so if you don't get off that particular stock in time then you're going to pay heavily for it and you know that's that's what i did over there so so it's it's not using the i don't use momentum to filter ideas out because trying to blend the two it will not work either ways if you get into a momentum stock at a late stage and say okay i'm going to hold this for now 3 years then you're going to shoot yourself in the foot but it's being aware at a certain stage okay what like you know what what flavor it has moved into and can you squeak you know squeeze a little more juice out of the whole thing so yeah, that's i, I got that part but just one clarity on the last part you mentioned i sorry i missed that i think uh, uh, you said you moved out of your position when the momentum turned against you uh the business was doing fine that you said so at the last stage you know i kind of switched my hat saying now this is in momentum there is, i don't i don't use any formulaic way of of exiting sure. stuff out which you should do if you if you want to get onto the momentum board so at that point of time again this may sound blasphemy for a lot of you know blue blooded uh, value investors but i kind of switched my my thinking into the a trader's mindset at that parabolic stage forget about momentum and forget about value this is now a trader stock and typically at the late stage if there is a blow off what should you do start taking your money off 
So I said, you know, now uh, forget about it being a momentum stock and all that other stuff. It's now in that parabolic, uh, uh, you know, it the valuations are through the roof. Nobody's looking at valuations and everything is is all bright and sunny and uh, it's all positive news. So time to start getting off the uh, off the train. And that's what I did. Now, again, it looks all nice in hindsight for who knows, right? Beyond that, it would have doubled over there also. But at a certain point, you have to deal, you know, you as in, I have to, I had to make a call that enough is enough. If, you know, if, if it is selling at 100 times speed, it is at such a valuation, I, you know, I, I can't sleep at night uh, well. So just exit it at that time. So it's just changing hats of how I'm looking at that idea at that point of time. In this particular example, it's not just blasphemous for the value guys, it's probably blasphemous for the momentum guys as well. You kind of got the best of both worlds uh, because ideally a momentum guy would probably be willing to give away, uh, uh, let's say 30% from the top because they sell while the stock's coming on its way down and never sell into strength. So you, in that sense, got a best of both worlds. What I would say is, if you bring another variable, which is, uh, again, I just... I just keep thinking about these different uh, threads or ways of investing and try to see, okay, what's the, what do they bring to the table? And the thing which I would say on momentum is that it is, again, you know, you'll have to correct me here if I am getting some part wrong, but if you're running it, let's say through an algorithm or a formula and all that you have to do uh, uh, is let's just spend a few hours, you know, non, uh, I think, I don't know if I'm getting the term right, non-discretionary, discretionary, whatever, automated, right? If I spend three hours and I get this return, which uh, which is 10% over and above the index, what I'm doing is pulling charts out, looking at this, looking at that. I mean, there is a lot of value to time, right? So in the end, if I get all of that at one tenth the, the time, if let's say if I turn the clock back completely 25 years back, and if I had a very different temperament, uh, again, uh, it comes down to temperament also. But if I had a very different tem- temperament and I was just purely looking at it from making money and I realized doing momentum, doing this three hours a week or something, some automated system gives me a slight edge of 2 to 3% over the index, I would happily take it. Uh, it's not a sure. it's not a, a badge, right? That I, you know, I'm not trying to be a Buffett or anything, right? Who will make a billion out of it. In the end, it's like, okay, you got a little bit edge, but I spent a much lesser amount of time. So if I come back from a, a time standpoint, one of the most efficient ways of doing it would be momentum or quant versus, you know, all this mumbo jumbo, right? So again, you know, it's some people, you know, a lot of us, including me, do it because we, we, we have fun in it, right? It's not, I'm not trying to maximize the, the efficiency of it. So maybe that's the sure. counterpoint I would say. Rohit, let's do one. I had a few more questions on the things you just said, but you know, instead of asking them right now, I'll probably give more structure to our conversation now from the perspective of a new listener or a beginner or somebody sure. who is trying to learn to the processes, right? So right, right. Let's, let's divide the whole, you know, everything in investing ultimately is about buying and selling and allocation and, you know, right, right, uh, right. creating a portfolio and you run a portfolio advisory. Uh, so all those decisions have to be kept in the context of the portfolio itself. Absolutely. Right? So let's first take the, the first aspect of your uh, investing, which is the, the buy sell engine. Mm-hmm. Let's do the buys first. How do you screen for your companies? What are you looking for in the ideas you are investing into? So, uh, are you, I mean, wh- whatever your criteria are and, right. uh, when you're looking for those criteria, what things you give more weightage to and less weightage to, because there's right. always a prioritization of the checklist one has to do. In right, right, right. So let's start with that first. Right. Again, this is, this is evolved over time, uh, uh, maybe 20 years back simple screens, simple formulas would work. I would run a very simple screen again, not automated screens, but I would run a very simple screen saying uh, ROC greater than this and P less than this and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, a Marico and a Pidlight and a Nation Paints would just pop out. And I would be scratching my head thinking, and by the way, I, I used to work in Asian Paints at one point, had a very close friend in Marico. So I would be scratching my head is that why is this company selling at 15? So it, it, it that was a different era, obviously. As times change, you have to adapt to that. Now there is, 
we can anybody can write a filter in like a minute or even less than a minute and and all of that all of those ideas will pop up so i stopped using screens maybe 8 to 10 years back again same thing after a certain point if you looked at if you looked at decent companies looked at uh, reasonable valuations uh, what i would uh, what i would usually find is anything cheap had some problems in it and it would usually be a value trap if i was looking at a good company uh, uh, then the valuations used to be and uh, i think it's natural right it's it's the normal competitive uh, sense in a market and no use complaining about it so i moved more i moved more into an ad hoc kind of a, an approach now i would uh, multiple filters right one is let's say i'm looking at a particular sector so let's say i would be tracking uh, the auto sector through its own you know through its own index or uh, i would be tracking the it sector or anything of that sort so i would keep uh, looking at the sector and if, as i read through the reports and some of that stuff i'll start looking at some of the companies second would be a lot of it is just you know just uh, exploring around just reading you know reading far and wide uh, i would be listening to some podcast list, watching some video and some company would come up and one of the one of the more important filters i use is there are there's a lot of content which is now published by pretty hard working investors you know who do a very good job at filtering the companies out so they would put a video out saying these are my top 10 ideas or something people will talk about companies on twitter and the first thing which i will do is i will pull up uh, pull up that particular stock and maybe use the first 10 15 minutes not for a selection but from more from a, a rejection standpoint does this company make sense now again earlier used to be a far more quantitative way of looking at it company is so much valuation so let me not look at it but now i have widened that that window quite a bit for the simple reason uh, i think the benefit of reading some of the academic research that the next 2 to 3 years of returns are anyway not correlated with valuations so when i read that i realized okay why should i put a filter of 25 and 30 when it is anyway not going to matter so again it it should not be crazy expensive like if it sells at 100 times earnings uh, i just cannot get confidence in those companies i i will not be able to sleep well so i, I no matter how good the business is i kind of tend but beyond that you know everything is fair game so from there the the analysis is more about rejection than than selection keep looking at the company drill down so look at the numbers it takes not more than 5 to 10 minutes you can go to any of these uh, top i use screener basically you know i know i use personally for a long time you know extremely good tool uh, so i use that look at the numbers next thing i would do is uh, look at the uh, ppt look at the uh, annual report what i'm trying to do at that point is uh, i've been guilty of that in the past of getting lost in the what do you call it lost in the uh, forest instead of the or whatever the trees instead of the forest try to get the big picture on it what are the three or four things which really matter for this company what are those key variables which are driving this position and can i kind of get a handle on it if i'm looking let's say at a at a metal company let's say it's a steel company one is obviously once it has started appearing in all the forums and everything maybe it's too late so yeah. uh, when i'm looking at that company if it is uh, and again by the way i've never held a steel company because that's not my area of competence but if if there is a china factor in it and i i cannot figure out what what china will do or do will not be able to do and that is going to drive the thesis then there's no point of looking at it so so i'll i'll do that kind of analysis and try to see uh, what are the main variables am i able to figure that part out and after that usually what i'll do is after i've read all of this i will leave it aside for a few days because what i've uh, what i've uh, what i've kind of discovered over time is that initially my my feelings about a company or my uh, the optimism or i would be feeling very good about a company and if i take a decision at that point of time i'll jump straight into it start a position and get myself locked into it so look at a company study it put it aside get on with something else then come back f- a few days a week or so later and a val- uh, one uh, thing which i have found to be a good exercise is to start putting a mind map on it so take a piece of paper you know draw it out i have you know i'm a i have i have my own way of kind of laying it out put the key variables and just think and mull over it and uh, again not a very scientific approach do that and at some point 
again uh, what i've seen over time is that it uh, in spite of all the math and the numbers you say it it often it just comes down to a gut feel and often that gut feel it works out sometimes it doesn't i used to have a very elaborate excel and a spreadsheet and all kinds of checklist but again that i think i've realized it's an overkill and at that point of time i'll just start a small position i usually won't take a a big position because again i come down to the same thing that it'll take much longer for me to get really comfortable understand the risks and everything so not a, not a very structured process but you know that's broadly how i fall and then uh, if i if i think uh, there is something missing in the company i'll put it on my track list tracking list and then come back to it once again some some video would pop up somebody would make some comment and that would that would connect the dots so it comes down to more around connecting the dots at a later point so for the start you are saying uh, your way of screening the companies have more moved towards from quantitative to some other common sensical methods you're saying you're looking at right, some other right. smart investors doing their work you are taking ideas from there and then doing your own study uh, but you also said something around index so i just wanted to uh, you know put across that point in a more uh, elaborate way what exactly you meant when you said you're looking at the index are you looking at index valuations and saying okay this index no. is now approaching the zone or what exactly are you doing there so again this is this is going to be you know uh, <laughs> again blasphemous for for value investors but you have the whole traders approach of how they look at stocks and how traders look at it right? like okay where is the i don't look at it at a stock level but let's say you know uh, an index is uh, is constantly dropping right it's again this again comes back from my prior experience i bought companies and then long term buy and hold and then i've sat on it and i've sat on it and waited you know for it to turn it has never turned so i was constantly thinking like if the numbers are right and the valuation i'll give you an example manapuram finance i used to hold that the valuations all seemed great uh, numbers were fairly good during the period which i held and the stock just went nowhere so it it passed all the filters passed all the checklist and still you know huge amount of opportunity loss so this came to a point of i have all these opportunity losses Uh, timing is sort of a, a, a no no in value right but again it's sure. important right you can't just you, ca- you can't just lock your capital for 2 years and hope and pray it all works so again started looking at you know how do traders do it how do momentum guys do it and what i found around traders is that they looking at they looking at you know how the charts are moving and moving averages and all that so what i would look at is again not an I- way to filter stocks out but way to avoid a sector so let's say it is on its way down and it is constantly the index is hitting let's say below 200 day moving average so forget about okay has it dropped from 30 p to 20 if p is not correlated then what's the next way of looking at it maybe it starts again these are all thoughts you know in in you know i mean i i, I keep changing the way i look at it but what sure. i found is that if 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 all the stocks are on their way down and the charts are on their way down then uh, you know let me just wait right let me look at that particular sector read it understand it but i don't need to make a decision i don't need to pull the trigger on it so i'll wait for it and i'll wait for all the selling pressure to go away and then you know as as traders say right the stock is in just a trading uh, zone right okay then let, let let me get a little more active and maybe as the as as stocks and at the industry kind of starts settling down and people are losing interest then towards the later part you know start looking at creating a a starter position in the past i would do my usual the hero jump right oh the stock is going down i am smarter than everybody it's getting cheap you know nobody understands it it it's going down 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 let me keep averaging up then i uh, over time i realized you know all this uh, you know i'm not buffet so <laughs> the, right so let me not buy stocks which are dropping because i am definitely missing something and the market is smarter than me so just nicely watch watch the sector watch the companies and wait for things to settle down wait for the the buying the selling pressures to go off and then uh, start looking at it when when it gets into those trading ranges so again uh, this is where um, how which your way traders approach it looking at it from that yeah, i i will come to uh, position building later also but just to Uh, solidify what you just said are you saying that 
adding to a dropping stock or basically you know uh, uh, positioning up on the first falling stock is something you have stopped doing oh yeah, yeah. Uh, completely correctly? okay yeah Just completely. Completely. i used to do okay. that i okay. not not as much because one thing which i always you know, this this phrase which i've always kept in my mind when when my position is dropping and i've seen a lot of people average down is uh, the first thing to do when you're in a hole is to stop digging so as soon as my position starts dropping down i think the one smart thing which maybe i would have done in the last 25 years of my investing is never average down and i think you know i can okay. i cannot recommend it enough okay it's Understood. one thing for the super investors and all the other people to do it but even when i had i had barely anything uh by i've never averaged down i i'll have a cap saying okay my usual positions will be x size and once it hits that that's it uh, you know no absolutely no averaging down and then you know okay. a few a few more experiences in the recent past and then what i've seen happen in the last two years in the us in india in other places where all these high flyers the saas companies and the technology stocks went into a nose dive it's just more, more and more it has just um, kind of um, uh, you know firmed up my my uh, my my view that absolutely no no again i will not i will not die a billionaire but then i don't also want to die you know completely poor or you know become poor in in the interim so it's again a risk management Hi friends I hope you are enjoying this episode so far uh, I just want to take a minute to thank the sponsor for this episode Now Stoic Talks was built on a premise of actionable insights and detailed questioning without constraints is the only way to get that and for that you need independence Now when you're looking for somebody to partner with you're not looking for somebody just who share your ethos but who also will promote this independence of you know asking fearless questions without any hesitations so when we were looking for someone like that the obvious choice for us was dsp mutual fund as i have known their team i have worked with their team for a long period of time now if you're an investor there's a high chance that you are already familiar with at least some if not all of the excellent research that they put in public domain there are reports like netra on the macro parameters then there is a report called the transcript which gives important snippet from the concord transcripts and discusses them then the annual report nectar uh, the navigator and many such excellent reports which i enjoy reading and is enjoyed by many practitioners in the investing community so we are extremely happy to be working with such a team they completely agree with our vision for stoic talks and i wholeheartedly want to thank them for supporting this episode If you aren't already I would highly recommend you to follow them on Twitter with their Twitter ID as @dspmf and you can also follow them on their YouTube channel where they put a lot of insightful videos regularly thanks and enjoy listening to this show so okay so just again solidifying for the listeners you're saying that when the index point you mentioned that is not really for the selection part that's it's only rejection. yeah it's rejection and also it's also in in some cases a falling sector might entice you to look at the sector but you're not going to buy it at that point in time Absolutely. so it might act as a initiation point so to speak for your yeah. study uh, from a sector perspective and right. other companies you are taking your boring ideas also from other smart investors and i'm pretty right. sure after so many years you know a lot about a lot of companies at least a bit about a lot of companies correct, correct, so correct. some ideas that flows helps. from there yeah and correct, so on correct. and so forth even uh, so even companies which i have held i will come back to the companies which i have held in the past and then it pops up in some screen so it's a and then again i have a, a continuous uh, running list of companies which i which i'm looking and tracking any point of time would be 40 50 companies looking at it and i have a i have a, like a wish list which is like the the bluest of the blue chips which i've kept them on the side and said if the world goes to uh, you know hell for a short period of time if the world doesn't end after that like a covid 20 or 2008 and then these are the companies i would love to own so just making this up let's say a titan right okay if i have a lot ends, of questions on that wish list <laughs> but i'm sorry but i i'm saying i have a lot of questions on those wish list sure sure uh, I, i'll come to that 
but let me also bring one more point to this uh, uh, selection part so when you have given all these these are only your screening criteria uh -huh. right uh, let let's also now look at your evaluation criteria now i remember i think the last time we met was somewhere 8 years back uh, right. when we met and we had discussion around checklists and you know forensics and we had right, a lot of discussion right. around those points and uh, we discussed a lot of things which were there on your checklist and it was a huge list if i remember correctly uh, um <laughs> from from yeah. i think 18 20 points on your even just the psychological checklist had around 18 20 points oh yeah, yeah behavioral one. checklist and then a lot of business checklist uh you passingly mentioned that uh, that was an overkill right so yeah. can you take us through the evolution of what used to be on your checklist mm -hmm. and what parts you realized that were overkill and which you realized were actually a good points to keep and you still keep them or you don't right. keep them at all whatever your current process is in terms of evaluation the way the checklist got built is that i started and this is a this is an era where you would not get as much data so you have to painstakingly pull an annual report read through it and then i would put those numbers into a spreadsheet and then every time i would read a book or some i would come across some concept or something i would i would plug it into that spreadsheet and then it you know, this i started this let's say in early 2000 over the next 15 years it just kept growing and growing and different tabs and you know i know a few friends who make fun of this this spreadsheet saying you have this 60 tab uh, excel so it just kept growing what what kind of uh, took me to a point where i thought it was an overkill is because after i had done all this work and then i still realized that uh, the success so again i am a very meticulous record keeper of my own uh, uh, investments uh, what is working what is not working you know what is the success rate what is the failure rate when i correlated i looked at the ideas which had failed and then i looked at my process i realized that doing all of this had not improved the 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 success rate so that was the first trigger right that this is not so the second thing which i then came to is okay what are the parts which um, do i really need to go through all of them now there are certain if i break down the 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 spreadsheet it was more let's say taking down all the quantitative numbers that was one aspect of it second is let's say the behavioral aspect the third is the business model and fourth would be the dcf and fifth let's say would be the uh, the accounting piece of it so the first thing which went out of the window was the valuation piece now i would do this whole elaborate spreadsheet about you know dcf and this multiple and that multiple and all that. i just threw it out because it was it was just it was not adding value you can put whatever numbers you want and you can make it all work out so i kind of threw that away right away and start thinking in terms of more like ranges and probabilities instead of agonizing over 30 times p and 28 times p just look at ranges and see where it is so that that part went out uh, right away uh, second part which i i kind of think through it but i would not sit and type into it is the behavioral piece no matter how many times you, i i wrote it down when the time came it's very tough you know just to look at the checklist and behave in a different manner so took some of that behavioral stuff out what i have added more is around the management piece which is more around that it it has now become a negative checklist are there any 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 red flags which i should be looking at and i will check it against those red flags so those have never those have not gone away what i have emphasized further is how well is the management executing so that's the other thing which i realized over time that uh, the different once you get your once you get the basic idea of the business the industry uh, fine it all comes down to how the management is executing and the way to you know the, the best way to do that is to look at what have they uh, pull out the last 8 to 10 years of annual report look at what they have said and what they have finally followed through so that that part i continue to do it i would look at what they what they had, let's say committed in 2008 or 2010 or 12 and then follow through the process has been i still use it uh, i don't meticulously update every every tab and everything it's more kind of just quickly run through it uh, and again it comes to the same same point that if if you if you're going to spend so much time on this spreadsheet is the roi on that time good enough so so there are aspects to it uh, some aspects i've just just dropped it uh, and again some of it becomes uh, second nature also so you don't have to keep typing 
all of that again and again into it. Sure. But end of the day, um, what where I've tried to come down to is that in a buying process, how quickly can I zone into the the key variables of that business? And if I'm yeah. let's say looking at a bank, instead of updating 20 tabs, the first thing I'm I'm going to look at is you know what is their cost of fund are they you know are they able to keep a, a low cost of fund in their operations second is how do they think about risk management and growth is this a management which is crazy about top line growth because if they are today or tomorrow they will blow the institution up because if you if you try to push beyond a limit no matter what you'll do crazy lending and you'll blow it up and third is obviously sure. around the, their credit underwriting and everything. So if I can zero down those three or four variables, then I can drill down instead of wasting my time on all kinds of peripheral issues, which may not may may not may not be important for that business. So that's how it has kind of evolved. You know, try to get down to the crux of that particular idea more than what you're essentially saying is your your checklist is now much more prioritized instead of giving mm-hmm. weightage to all the points. Correct, uh, correct, correct, correct. You, you know, you are now look, looking at few, five, six major checklist points, correct. which are very important. How quickly can I come to those? Yeah. And, and I think those will also have some variations vis-a-vis the business model and vis-a-vis the kind right. of companies you're looking at. Right, right. Uh, um, I mean, I can fully relate to that whole process of, you know, with years, your checklist becomes, I think I have told this to many people that, the difference between a novice investor and a experienced investor is that for novice investor, all the checklist points are equal. It's not Correct. a portion of number of points. I think everybody can now get a hold of hundred oh, yeah. checklist points to have. Correct, uh, it's Correct. just Correct. a matter of you learn to prioritize uh, pertaining Absolutely. to that particular company and business. Okay. Correct. So, uh, how, uh, how big is your checklist? Uh, you have seen my checklist, dude. You remember, right? <laughs> yeah, this is the reason I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my spreadsheets are equally big, very, very big, uh, number, but, <laughs> but then my working is very, uh, my, my reason for having that is that I have decided to convert a lot of, uh, qualitative questions, which people generally have and okay. try to see more of those coming from the numbers themselves. Uh, okay. I mean, from, so, so like Rohit, you mentioned, right. I want to see the execution of the management. So, okay. I try to build elaborate models around capital allocations using the cash flow statement and try to get a lot of answers from there only. So those you analytical an sheets how, are more. How do you do yeah, that? Yeah. So how, oh, okay. so how do I do it is um, like, like an example, like when you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So eventually every cash flow line item can be, categor- right. I mean, it's ultimately a source of fund or an application of fund in, right, and right. not from accrual based, but a complete cash Cash, cash basis. Basis. right yeah so when you do that you differentiate between one line item as either source or application because it is negative if it's negative it is going to be a, a, a source and otherwise it's application uh oh, sorry vice versa so when you do that you are able to bifurcate the sources and application right year on year and on cumulative basis so what i do is right. uh, so one line item can act as a source or as an application depending on your time frame Right? So in many cases, equity can become a source, but if you have given more dividends than what you have raised, it will become more like an application of one kind of a, a correct, model. Correct. So the I see, I divide those and I can share that with you offline also. And I see it over time, over multiple time frames. Correct, so correct. I will see three years, three years, three years, three years. Then I will see six years and six years together. Then I will right. see over the 12 years journey and individual journeys also. And there's a model which is helping me do that. So okay. Uh, so earlier it was more towards, you know, the same analytical so stuff was less, too much of checklist points. Correct. But now my spreadsheets have evolved more towards analytical points. But this podcast is not about me. So Manish, I will stop now. <laughs> it's more about uh, Rohit's process. So let's stick to that. No, no, I, it's uh, great too. I mean, I would also, anyway, I think we should, we should connect and we should talk about it because one of my, uh, I would not say obsessions, but one of my areas of focus is how do you, uh, and I keep bringing this, how do you, how do you improve uh, amount of time which you spend. There's obviously a certain minimum amount of time which you have to spend to analyze yeah. an idea, but how do you kind of, you know, I think in a in an era where, you know, we have the, the likes of Mr. Manish and others who have automated systems, right? And these automated systems do extremely well and, you know, they, they yeah. require much less amount of time. We have to adapt to that. You can, 
you can uh, uh, take a, a very artisanal approach of analyzing every annual report but then you have to concentrate yeah. more because obviously you're going to only look at a handful of companies and then i'm very uncomfortable with being over concentrated so with time being a limit uh, how do you bring all these you know automated and quantitative so that's why i was more interested in maybe we should I mean, talk later the, the more you yeah. try to bring it from numbers now it gives uh, it's that prioritization becomes very easier when you focus okay. it on on those things so uh, all the key qualitative questions be it around pricing be it around uh, you mm-hmm. know seasonality mm-hmm. of the business cyclicality of the business most mm-hmm. of those now i answer using my analytical models so that is okay. that is a shift i have made from last i mean when we met last uh, right. and in that last 8 10 odd years uh, that has Correct. been my shift but again mm-hmm. not about me today <laughs> we'll focus on mm-hmm. your your process we'll get in yeah, touch we again later on maybe that. yep we yeah, should sure so um, okay so now i have understood your buying uh, at least not buying at uh, the screening process the screening process uh, and a, yeah and a bit about your analysis process right analytical right. work which you're doing it regarding your checklist right. broadly you have mentioned it in your other interviews also i was seeing that you know some part of your checklist are touched here and there uh let's now take it to the zero down towards buying mm-hmm. so what what now finally makes into your list because eventually you are also doing portfolio management you are doing portfolio Correct. advisory not every stock will make into the list right right uh, even if you like it so what is that cut off criteria um actually sorry rohit let me do one thing i just had one question around your process also let me ask that right now okay mm-hmm. so one thing which you mentioned and which i want to ask around that point of evaluation is that your management checklist has mm-hmm. evolved with a bit more negative aspects of uh, mm-hmm. you know of what to avoid right right Right. Uh, not only management, but give me your absolute no nos, uh, which will, which will Break kill your idea for you in yeah in fifteen twenty minutes. You will that that if you find that point, you're just not going to rush that company. Let me just have those f- few negative uh, things you look at. Usually, uh, and I will not go into specific names, but usually, uh, I've avoided companies which. which uh, their um, their source of success is their 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 political uh, their political power like the only reason why they are so successful in that area and they're making these super profits is because they have the right connections because that's a very and it's not a it's not a moral argument or anything i don't get into moral or outside of maybe investing in a gutka company or a cigarette company uh i don't get into moral arguments over here it's you know my morals uh, may be different from somebody else's but anyway right so uh, it's not a moral argument i try to make my 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 concern is that when you get into that model if a, if a management uh, or the source of their advantage or competitive advantage is the the political linkages they have that can that can kind of evaporate if the winds change right so i kind of usually avoid that uh that is first second is in other cases it's uh, what i've or uh, what i've kind of learned over time is you have to be comfortable with shades of gray i have all these checklists where i would say uh, you know i'm checking all the points and i've as i look back on the numbers uh in terms of the results i've realized that you always have to think in terms of context and how much you're ready to let go i think sure. it, you know with age you realize that uh you know all these things you you know you try to whether it is management friends family if you try to be too specific about this is this is right and this is wrong obviously you don't want to you don't want to buy into a company where the management the the, the leadership has been convicted of murder and he's in jail or something <laughs> you know, those are extreme cases mm-hmm. that they immediately mm-hmm. drop off but outside of that it is all uh, a composite picture it's earlier it would be okay. uh, is the management overreaching that right? are they overcompensating obviously that will be an irritant for me but now i would say that's fine if they are creating value and uh, uh, you know if they are getting they are overcompensating themselves i live with it it i use the analogy of riding a tiger with my subscribers when i have written about it that you know you're on a tiger and this and this is a risky position uh think accordingly if if things go bad the stock could suddenly collapse and especially if you know when every time when you have these market market failures these kind of stocks collapse hard 
so mm-hmm. but outside of that you know it's not a, a very there are very few but again if more than one start popping up then definitely so let's say politically connected sensitive sector and then there are too mm-hmm. many related party transactions you know uh, mm-hmm. they they have all kinds of subsidiaries and all kinds of uh, funny stuff going on at the same time management is getting you know overcompensated if too many such pointers come up and if i see more than two or three then the threshold keeps dropping and at that point i'll say let's move on to some, something else so it's not okay. one single criteria but i would i would put three or four criteria together and if it happens it it's again uh, which is where this uh, whole execution thing has been uh, it has has gained more and more prominence i what my personal experience has been a little bit of a, a, a want of a better word a little bit of a management which is not pristine but which executes well is still again no moral arguments right you uh, you're not trying to make friends or you're not trying to become some you know partner with them in that sense but the mar- yeah. ma- the market seems to be more tolerant around it versus uh, uh, if your execution sucks you could be you could be you know the best of the management and you could be doing everything very ethically the market will not care about it. and this is where i think again uh, momentum and quant in, 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 in investing has a major uh, i would say advantage over value right they don't care whether you know what you know what you think about the management if those yeah. few factors are working out okay let's go ahead and invest in it but you know, if it makes my stomach churn i will not uh, i will not invest in it all right so now we have got a picture on your screening methodology your evaluation methodology now let's go to the selection part eventually selection some something will make into a portfolio and something will not um right so what is your what is your buying thresholds or criteria i, I now Threshold. understand that valuation valuation has now reduced in terms of importance it is it might still be there but it has reduced in terms of importance it's so a what filter. makes it your should... final list yeah mm-hmm. it uh, value should not be a headwind that's all i i look at it should not be extreme that you know uh, the multiple yeah. compression will cause you know returns to drop so wh- wh- one of the other things i'm you know i'm i'm a big proponent of diversification not just in number of stocks i would try to see try to think what are the key variables driving that that company or industry so let's say if i am looking at a plywood company and a real estate company and both are correlated to the real estate cycle then i kind of lump them into that bucket so my thought process will be is my uh, is my diversification increasing or is my diversification uh, going down and i would prefer to have companies which are spread across sectors instead of having uh companies which are driven by the same uh, same variables if you may and again it, it's not a very hard defined formula i have to sit and think through it and see okay what are the variables which are driving all these different companies together some variables you cannot diversify away and if it's uh, everything is india based and if india has trouble then but are these all export companies or import companies so that's that's one kind of th- uh, criteria so if i already have let's say just making this up if i already have let's say three financial services company uh, mm-hmm. one has to go out for the other to come in you know that will be the first criteria second is ideally i would want a new company to enter into the uh, into the uh, and i tr- usually try to keep 18 to 20 stocks in the portfolio so i will look at okay what is my weakest uh, you know this usual 101 what is the weakest position take that out replace that and usually will start with a smallish position so i, I rarely go up a 5 to 7% because that is a threshold at which i am comfortable so i'll start with a small position let's say 2 3% start a you know, start a kind of a, a, a the first thing it will do is i will start just a like a toe hold i will i will just create a very tiny position it will be like a 0.5% or a 1% and start following the company because what i've realized is that tracking list and all that is fine but once you put money in a stock it changes your approach when you when you see your when you see when you are making money or losing money your attention to that company goes up so it, it just it just you know i've seen my own and other people's psychology also again within a certain limit so i'll i'll put a little bit of money and then start tracking you do it in your advisory at, portfolio at, also uh, no to, no no to... i will not start in that way i don't want uh, you know all the subscribers to pay for my experiments <laughs> So I will. Okay. Okay. I'll do this it in my in your personal, personal portfolio. portfolio. So eventually, it will flow to your uh, advisory portfolio. Okay. Right, Please and I declare ahead. it. I tell the subscribers that you know this is the these are the ten small positions which I am tracking. 
it's not advice and i'm not asking you to buy it or nothing of that so just i'm i'm just tracking them okay. and i'll track them and i'll watch it uh and so quite a few will just fall off and then if i get comfortable and if the management and that getting comfortable can sometimes vary one quarter two quarter sometimes i will not get comfortable after three quarters and i'll just drop it off once i get comfortable then it will be a graded uh, increase sometimes it goes straight from let's say half a position to one position because some variable which i was tracking or i was able to connect some dots and then a uh, uh, results come in and it just clicks and then i'll just take it to a 5% position maybe sometimes a little bit more than that if not then it will get stuck in that in that size for 3 6 6 months 12 months and at certain point i will realize that this stock is not going anywhere the company is not going anywhere and it will get anyway washed out when the next next idea comes in so mm-hmm. it's it's a graded generally i usually don't scale into the full position right away and on this topic uh, of position sizing uh, rohit uh, how big do you allow it to go in the past i have allowed it to go more than 15% and then i've burned my fingers on that so usually not more than 10 now again so uh, it, it's all at market value you will start scaling it down is that what you're saying right i will it again uh, i have given buck different i think when we talk about selling we can talk more it's different different criteria one of the one of the criteria in my head is that once it is above 10% this company in a, is in a special kind of a bucket where it needs to be tracked more closely and uh, if things are not working let me start uh, and again I have a, a sort of a, a thumb rules in my head let's say if it's a large position and uh, mm. a bunch of the other things which we were talking right it's a large position valuation seems to be extreme a lot of momentum around it okay let's start taking it off it's a large position extreme valuations let's uh, let's kind of you know take it so it's a bunch of things i'll put together and say it's all it's all coming down to basically risk is this large position adding to risk so but yeah above 10% it gets into that below that between 5 and 10 it's in that yellow kind of a zone that okay you know i may may take it down may take it up below if it's a let's say a 3% position then i will i will give it far more leeway because it it's not going to move the portfolio needle that much right if i get it wrong i'll lose maybe a half a percent on my portfolio if it does so, extremely so, well know, also it it will not we will come to the selling part again but uh, let's close this particular loop here only uh in right. case we miss it later uh so 10% let's say just hypothetical right so a position became mm-hmm. maybe you at cost it was 5% or 6% mm-hmm. this position did mm-hmm. much much better than other positions and it became 10% mm-hmm. which is your mental threshold again it's not written you are not mm-hmm. uh, quantitatively applying this but it's a mental threshold for you right so it it reaches mm-hmm. that 10% uh, percent stage you are now more mm-hmm. closely monitoring it um right uh would you go out of or trim your position based on opportunities also or let's say i mean if you're in a market where opportunities are mm-hmm. not really that much you know you know in a crazy kind of a market mm-hmm. uh you would say dude if i take out the money i don't have an option i'll have to move to cash right and moving right. to cash might not be a great way i want to stay in the stock just because my alternate is cash or do you have a view on cash position raising at that point in time so i want to basically this question also mm-hmm. takes into consideration your thought about cash, the cash. as a part of your allocation yeah. i usually don't think of cash uh, as a quantity but it's more a kind of a, a balancing equation if you may right putting your formula yeah. together and whatever is the net is it, it kind of balances the whole thing out so again i have been personally i would say Uh, over cautious all my investing life uh, you know to the point of being paranoid i just don't want to blow off blow up so i have usually held more cash than i should have even looking back it ranged between 5 to 20% sometimes even above that but i will not hesitate to come out of a position and put into cash whether i have or i don't have a position again i am not putting cash because i have a certain view of the market or uh certain view of where the economy yeah. or all yeah. of that will go it's just that i you know i am not finding i am not finding ideas which i want to put in it but uh, mm. usually as markets start correcting and more ideas coming up cash cash starts going down as markets get euro euphoric can i i stop running out of ideas cash goes up and that will happen even if the independent of everything uh, for me if a position i'm getting uncomfortable with it and if it's too big 
I'll sell it down and and it goes into cash and that's a different mental bucket. Cash is a different mental bucket. Positions are a different mental bucket. Finding a new idea is a different mental bucket. All independent of each other. But let me put it this way: I'm not afraid of holding cash even if it drags my performance. So be it. And I've told my subscribers also. Uh, I invest my own family's portfolio is in the same way. So if I if I'm not comfortable with it and my family is not comfortable with it, you know I will not do it. I will not do it in any other way. And obviously there is a there is a, a penalty of holding so much cash, but you know right. keeps uh, my blood uh, pressure down. <laughs> okay, fair point. But uh, but okay. So fa- when was the last time you went into that larger you know cash positions? I mean, just to get an idea about how and when it was. Uh, this was 2018 time frame, roughly, okay. and then, then it was in, into your in the depths. Of cash. It was. Uh, right and then it was early 2020 like you know before, uh, before the covid so covid was a very interesting time and we could you know we could talk a little more at a later point um, i i started i started or when, we can talk now you can again can, as you know we'll bring yeah. it in you can talk about it now right. yeah. i usually don't try to time right because i'm not not good at it but uh, as i started looking at how covid was developing in late uh, february uh just the whole thing around uh, you know the 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 mental model of compounding which people keep talking about right and what i saw around i think a lot of investors got this right actually because they kind of think constantly about compounding and we could see right that infection rates were increasing by let's say whatever x percentage of 5% per day and if you did a very simple extrapolation you could see that this was going to go this was going to go parabolic so i even actually wrote a post and i published it to my subscriber saying in the next 8 to 10 days there's going to be a, a, a oh shit moment where uh, this all these things are going to go through the roof and governments are going to panic and people are going to panic and i think a lot of investors kind of you know caught that i saw all around me the you know the uh, you know even my own personal family felt that you know my wife felt i was overreacting and then you know you don't argue numbers with your wife right so <laughs> but at least in my portfolio that's when i started going into cash and then obviously i became you know very concerned about how this thing was so that was the only thing which i when when i went into cash and i didn't exit out quickly out of cash because again i you know i kind of underestimated how how much how much liquidity would get pumped and how it would and again it uh, it all kind of boils down to your own personal experiences around investing right the era the time your your family background so in the past all these bear markets would be slow grinding would take like my first bear market was in 2000 actually from 2001 ish to 2002 or 3 and even prior to that you know there was no there were no there were no parabolic takeoffs it was the market would slide 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 and then it would meander for months and you know years together and you would completely get grinded out and then slowly the market would recover so i kind of thought if that happens the best of us would lose his patience so i i didn't jump in so that's how my kind of cash remained high and uh, then slowly you know obviously as opportunities kept coming up uh, you know i I've, i've reduced cash but uh, usually you know it's it's usually in in, in low double digits often right 10 10 15% is the cash i would generally keep goes down yeah, just to, only five fine just to close the loop on that point uh, was the reason of not going into more cash when you saw trouble you know creeping into the markets or possible trouble keeping into the markets uh, w- somewhere at the back of your mind was it that okay 20% is my threshold of maximum cash and i don't want to go more than that uh, uh, or, or it, that is more uh, around huh, huh, the, that is more around the same aspect and again it's not a very scientific way but it's that again another thumb rule i use is i don't know about what's going to happen and, yeah, and sure. as a matter of fact nobody does but then people thinks they do but that's a different point so if i don't know what's the best way to do it 50 50 so i don't want to be out of equities completely because then getting into it is another story all together when do you get in but at the same time it all comes down to uh, at i kind of bring it down to a threshold where i can keep my sanity and my rationality intact like if i if i'm fully invested if you know different people right some people will will absolutely want to be 95% invested and will stick to it some people are very paranoid will be a lot in cash i sit in between i so at that point i thought let me bring enough cash again from from a different vantage standpoint that i could deploy it at a later point i'll remain rational when the market is crashing 
and you know the 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 drop is much lesser so i kind of brought it down to a not a very scientific level but brought it down to a point where cash was almost 30 to 40% of the portfolio but there were oh. companies which i felt were good enough uh, and if if things if and when things survive these were fundamentally sound companies and they will and i did an exercise actually at that point where i looked at each company and i uh, i actually wrote a note and then shared it with my subscribers at a later point because if i had shared it that time they would have panicked was like if everything goes to zero in the sense that the lockdown continues for a year which of these companies would survive so i did that mm-hmm. for every position said revenue goes to zero how will they survive for the next 6 to 9 months and i did that in 2008 also so if revenue goes to zero how much can they reduce cash or uh, sorry reduce cost how much cash do they have how much can they borrow so what is their runway basically of survival and some companies had a 6 months runway 9 months 12 months or like extreme stress test and then you know based on that if i thought that you know this company was a little bit on the edge keep it keep the position size down or sell it off so so that's how i did but those are very extreme uh, extreme cases most of the times it's bits are run of the mill ses- uh, recession like it, it, we're talking of now right recession mm-hmm. is going to come up and all that i ignore all of that you know i don't that doesn't factor into my cash this thing i mean it's part and parcel of life so you know, why worry about recessions Stoic Talks has been partnered by DSP Mutual Fund, which was an obvious choice for us, having worked with the DSP team earlier and recognizing how they are obsessed with helping investors take better decisions. Some examples of their motivation to help investors do better are visible in their research-related work, uh, which they make available for free, including Getting Smarter, Tatya, Report Card, their Invest for Good blog, among others. We thank Team DSP for supporting this episode of Stoic Talks and recommend that you follow them on Twitter at DSPML. Yeah, Rohit, I'm still not able to get my head around it. Uh, essentially, you were saying that through your analysis, you pretty mm-hmm. much predicted a corona crash. I mean, uh, not you don't know how, how, how right. much it will crash, but at least right. you were able to figure out that this is going to go parabolic. And yeah. the infection yep yeah my point is why did you just uh, take a 40% cash call why not go 100% cash and if if anything hedge it with some puts i mean i'm it's a trader in me thinking if i'm able to correct, correct, foresee correct, that point. yeah right yeah. so again uh, uh, i i you know i did buy some puts again for my personal portfolio right but by that time the the the, the volatility you know it it was all of this kind of transpired in a matter of days right by the time i kind of got clued onto it uh, a lot of other smart investors had also started cluing onto it so the so puts and all of that were not very you know were not priced very you know like were not True. attractively priced so that True. was one part of it second uh, by the time i started again uh, this is this happened like over a span of two weeks or maybe a week or so and by the time i started exiting a lot of some of the positions which i had were getting into a situation where the market started pricing them for a very extended uh, like a downturn like okay you know the market is going to go fat for the next uh, or the economy is going to go completely uh, down for the next 6 to 9 months so at that point i realized that there is no point in just throwing everything out let me uh, and and it you know in hindsight even that i actually wrote to my subscribers also it was like a 50 50 bet 50 50 market recovers quickly economies recover quickly and we are off to the races which is what happened or 50% everything goes completely haywire so i said i honestly i can see where the infection is but i cannot i cannot foresee what happens after the, the, the you know extrapolating the the graph and everything was one thing but saying okay this will cause a complete lockdown and how long the lockdown will continue was a tough one was a tough call to make that second order effect right and the third order and fourth as so i said let me take a 50 50 bet right let me bring it down enough but still remain invested enough that if and when the when the parabolic uh, you know or whatever the the recovery happens i'm still kind of you know exposed to it so again no nothing matter matter just sheer saying that i don't want to take a view on how things will work out 
and taking a completely 50 50 bet and then post april when things started recovering i started i started putting money in so so that helped i mean basically that is what i did okay i just wanted to know that you know i have spoken with lot of value investors uh and 2020 corona crash has had a paradigm shift uh in the way they think uh has it impacted you as well have you changed your approach post the lessons from this crash so uh, let me let me maybe put the question back what kind of paradigm shift have you seen with with other so without naming names uh, i know people uh, i know people who are uh, uh, started taking care of the downside risk now so they know their okay. exit plans yeah. okay 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 so in my case uh, the covid crisis actually did not change my 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 thought process in that much for me uh, Uh, things which grab my attention and you know like really uh, you know make me question are when my my individual stocks go completely haywire and when i say haywire it's not 20 30% drop so i've had maybe over my entire investing lifetime three or four stocks which have gone down by more than 50 60% and when that happens that that has you know that i, I would spend weeks months maybe you know i, I mean i very vividly remember all these stocks right and then i've done a lot of questioning about my process and about my thinking and those when whenever those things have happened i've kind of looked at okay what went wrong so that happened more around the 2018 time frame i had i had invested in some of the financial services and these companies i did all kinds of analysis poured over their accounts looked at their loans did all kinds of stuff and got it completely wrong has happened to me in early 2000 when i i bought a company called ssi and that went 97% down or 90% down but i was you know very new to it so i you know didn't know absolutely anything about what i was doing so my my mindset change my mindset change around risk management uh, got maybe i started putting more focus in the 2018 time frame when i saw certain positions go completely against and it's more around not that i got the position wrong it's about which i get obviously from time to time it was like i did all the work followed all the rules which i have put in place in my own case right and then in spite of that got it completely wrong so then it was not that you know what did i do wrong like what went wrong from a from a thought process thinking and that is where all this exploration around momentum around trading around quant started coming up like i clearly saw there was a blind spot in the way you know i was approaching all of this uh, this stuff and it made sense to read all of all of these other approaches philosophies and sick and and look at you know what so so by the time 2020 uh, crash came uh, i definitely started looking at you know the the whole risk management and downside protection so not 2020 but uh, prior to that got pretty much about your allocation strategies from i mean deriving from what so i'll just summarize those points which you just mentioned right uh, you, before i do that do you also have industry uh, limits like for stocks you have mentioned yeah, threshold I of do. around 10% yeah, yeah. Uh, ha 15 i'll generally keep it around 15% again right if i have two 15. positions usually it will not go above 15 again same okay. thing has come from some of the failures i've had in the portfolio i allowed it to go and again when i say industry i don't look at it purely from industry it's also okay driver, are there similar drivers common I mean, teams like, which are driving it right yeah, yeah same value yeah. drivers if you may right so yeah but 15 so again same thing uh, paranoid about not losing money and i keep telling that to my subscribers you may not made exceptional money but you know that's the price you pay so uh, you know, with india doing well and things doing well and i have i personally always felt you don't have to go crazy after the returns if you take care of it and you live long enough <laughs> the numbers will come so you at any point in time you're going to have close to around seven different set of let's not call them industry but something where the group is being categorized by some driving points uh different set of driving right, right. forces uh seven to eight or correct. whatever be the case right so correct correct uh, whatever it is. and and you also mentioned that you are generally your starting positions are 0.5 to 1 percent. If you're doing your personal portfolio, where you're doing also some testing, testing the waters kind of thing. Right, But right. But in right, your right. advisory portfolio, it starts somewhere between 2 to 3 percent, and then you scale it up as it comes. Correct. Correct. 
Uh, correct, correct correct yeah that that's a fair that's a fair that's a fairly accurate uh, way of how i manage it okay so 2 to 3% scale up uh, sometimes Five. at at cost level how much do you go or or 10% is there also i mean at generally your stocks will be moving no, up because at cost of your... level usually 5 max it will go to 6 or 7 but it it has rarely ever gone up of that i just don't i'm not just comfortable putting more than that uh, i don't recall last maybe once or twice it would have happened but mostly you know it it will get capped at 5% and again uh, i think with time markets have become so much efficient by the time i figure it out the world has figured out much before me <laughs> so the position runs up those sure. times used to exist earlier i'm telling you 14 15 you know yeah. you figured it out and then aram say you kept you raising it the and then it, it, yeah yeah markets give you enough time to respond and do it now the by the time you kind of figure out 50% of it the 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 i mean Uh, there will be five youtube videos on really it and uh, uh, 50 oh, reports yeah, yeah, on yeah. it <laughs> oh yeah yeah now you know the, i mean it's uh, it's become a it's become a young ma- it has always been a young man's game but you know the 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 the, the efficiency in indian markets is mind boggling it's uh, sure. you know what is working today will definitely not work in the next 6 months so that's that's the other you know treadmill we are all on <laughs> sure so uh, so okay so then that is the case that you do 2 to 3% and maximum 5 to 7% on your cost basis and right, uh, right. because of market if it goes beyond 10% you start thinking about the position more seriously correct uh, correct and correct. and for sector you said that a replacement 15, of a company, 15 yeah 15% and a replacement of an idea happens uh, either because of your position size becoming too large so you have to think about next idea to replace it with or Right. Uh, something is more enticing given your current risk profile of the company which is there correct and correct correct something is a better risk reward uh, in your portfolio is that a fair right, right, right. summarization right, right, of what right, you right. how you manage it absolutely yeah yeah okay. yeah fair enough now let's uh, and i, I think, think pretty much that answers you know sell, selling or oh, sorry i'm saying nothing fancy very straight forward 101 <laughs> okay 101 of uh, portfolio management Yeah, and I think one point I uh, missed to summarize, which is you don't do any kind of uh, averaging down anymore. Uh, yeah. When you are yeah. you are scaling up the position, pretty much the, the prices will be higher than what you bought them for in the initial right. phases. Uh, or little bit five ten percent here and there. Yeah, five ten percent here and there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here and there usual, uh, you know, bouncing around is happening. That's fine. The fundamentals should be improving. If the price is a little bit down, a price is a little bit up, it's okay. But you know, if things start going south, the stock I bought it's now down twenty. Obviously, I the the first thing which I want to do is I want to exit. It. I should be exiting it. But let's say I feel that two three years time frame, the the company will do well, and for various reasons, stock is going down. The first thing I want to the first thing which I will do is I will not average down. I'll just hold it Understood. up to a certain threshold I, I and mean, pull the plug. I mean, the reason plug. for averaging down. because of valuation has been eradicated i think that will be a much better oh yeah 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 uh, i think i've actually. kind of yeah i've learned over time that the market does get it right far more than i we would want to give it credit for so when sure. if if i am left scratching my head saying company is doing okay but why is the stock dropping if you can figure out why the stock is dropping it's it's hmm. the answer is fairly simple i right? will say oh, company is not doing well numbers are bad the the basic model is broken so It's a very simple decision. Sell, exit, you're done. It's usually in the cases where I think the numbers are looking good as of now. Everything is checking out, but the stock keeps dropping. I think that's where the dissonance comes in. Now, in the early, in, in the past, I would kind of hold ground and say, you know what? No, I'm I'm smarter. I know better, and all of that. Now, I've learned, you know, school of hard knocks that you know, give more credence to what the market is telling you. Uh, hmm. At least pause and wait. uh don't don't jump in save your capital if you turn out to be right you'll get an opportunity at a later point also but don't add to it so that that's what i end up that's that that you know that's the change i have done over time not that i've been i've i've averaged on much i've rarely done that but uh, stopped it completely okay. fair enough so uh so i think one point which uh i probably or maybe two points which i think i'm missing in the whole portfolio construction zone Mm-hmm. Uh, which probably uh, listeners would want to learn from but also i i want to bring your advisory component to picture right so since mm-hmm. advisory is one of your services uh when you are pro- pro- 
providing portfolio as a advice you have to think mm-hmm. of liquidity of the stocks because of you know uh, right. moving hypothetically from a stock by saying okay sell it out versus yeah. right. you know position to actually people to sell it out of the position how do you think right. about liquidity for your advisor for for your clients and uh, right. Uh, okay second question i will ask separately you can answer the liquidity pass yeah. first no i i do uh, a p- personal portfolio i would not but i have i put this filter in in the last few years usually mm-hmm. i would look at I, I, I we don't we don't we don't manage money directly so i have to just guess right so the number of people who are subscribed into i'll just assume a certain portfolio size into percentage of that position so i'll just make some numbers up right let's say 100 people investing 25 lakhs per individual uh that is let's say uh, 0.25 crores let's say 25 crores right 5% of that is let's say 1.25 crores so if it is 1.25 crores i would look at a stock where at least the daily volumes can all my subscribers including me buy this stock in a day or two days of liquidity or exit out of it so i'll generally think of that because if we are if if all all the subscribers including me are going to account for a week's liquidity then i you know we could get stuck so mm-hmm. i would usually and there are lot of such companies which do come up which appear to be attractive the, the volumes are very high same thing uh, school of hard knocks right uh, yeah. bought a stock which uh, had a again that's the other interesting thing you brought this up right at the time of buying if you end up buying a stock let's say it's 2000 crores market cap or 3000 crores market cap usually there will be enough volume at that level if it is doing fine and the market cap is that high now if i start averaging down and that 2000 3000 crore stock then lands up into the 1000 crore this thing and now if i say now exit not only will my subscribers murder me for losing 70% of that money exit becomes impossible right because a you're trying to exit out of a thinly traded stock which used to be traded fine but you know now it has become thinly traded and on top mm. of that uh, the market cap is low and so it, it so i i'm not even looking at liquidity at that time i'm assuming let's say it's a 20% drop how much liquidity under normal circumstances will be there and then obviously those those companies i just take them off because uh, you know then we'll get stuck and we'll actually create the impact cost again you know uh, same thing has happened from fair experience point. that you know you get stuck and yeah. becomes very tough to exit so fair point. I, actually the reason of asking this question was primarily from the subscribers point of view if correct, somebody correct, correct. Support, you know so it's a very valid point. A very important uh, criteria right, right. Uh, individuals second, i used to never bother but yeah 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 the the yeah. second point is also related pretty much to this uh to this point only uh how do you manage the dissonance between your portfolio versus a advisory portfolio given the fact that you have a constant income to put into the into the you know in, into your portfolio because you have a job you know you're taking surplus cash from there and you're putting it into the portfolio so you right. are more doing like a flow flow based investing whereas your subscriber mm-hmm. might be doing a more lump sum driven investing you know they have dedicated let's say right. okay I, w- i want to invest 10 lakh into what rohit is saying uh, and that will become like a more lump sum approach so how do you deal with that thought process when you think about with... your subscribers what is individual right. uh, the way i have approached it is that uh, uh, it's more in terms of a, a percentage allocation right so again this is a question which has come up for a lot of people also ask the same thing i think anybody who gives advisory and does not manage the money directly will always have this question whether i am doing it for myself or somebody else and the way i have usually handled for myself and for subscribers when they ask or anybody who asks this right is let's say you have 100 uh, uh, in your portfolio and let's say 5% is allocated uh, across 20 positions now uh, usually what i would do is let's say 100 goes to 120 so one option is you you rebalance everything to uh, to 5% and allocate all that extra money out into all those positions i usually will not do that for myself and what the way i've approached it is that uh, whatever i do for my personal portfolio is exactly what gets put in the in the model portfolio so if i'm doing something in my personal portfolio only that goes into the model so what i would tell subscribers and what i end up doing is let's not allocate the the extra capital out to companies which are not in the buy range allocate it out based on the same percentage to the new idea so let's say 
a company which was 5% and you added 20, let's say 20, 20 to the portfolio and now it has become 120, the weightage has dropped. Then so be it. It's not optimal, but then instead of 5, now that position has become, let's say, 4.5. Now a new position comes in and it's at 3%, it's at a 3% of the new size. So 100, 100 ka you take uh, 3% and you add to that. At a later point, this old position, if if it either increases or if I'm going to add more, we'll add. So it's a little convoluted way, unfortunately, uh, of, of approaching it. But that's how we, at least I do it for my own personal portfolio. If new cash comes in, you're not going to proportionately allocate to all companies out just because you want to maintain a certain threshold. It's more around the new ideas which are coming in, but on the new base. So something like Actually, that. Actually, that is where I was coming from that, you know, that that, that in itself would lead to the, you know, uh, variations between a portfolio sizing in your portfolio versus your client portfolio because client is not doing SIP kind of a thing in your portfolios, right? He has bought and he is holding that position and but the stock right. might be in your buy range and just the sheer fact that out of 10 stocks, let's say five are in your buy range when your next uh, money comes in, uh, you will be increasing your allocations to those stocks and your portfolio will become more, uh, you know, more heavy on those names. Uh, but for your client for your for your uh, subscriber that will not be the case and eventually and again i know i understand that market to market will be very different and there is probably no right answer to this so that's why i'm asking how do you manage mm -hmm. this uh, but uh, there might be some extreme events like covid crash like other places where uh, you know you get the opportunity and the scale will obviously three four five names will get much higher allocation in that case Correct. Uh, how do you manage that dissonance or do you go back and rebalance after a certain point? Uh, just trying to understand around this. There is rebalancing happening. Uh, it, uh, the way I'm looking at it is there are two variables in this, right? One is the denominator, right? So the, so the portfolio is not run based. So the way we have structured the portfolio is it's a, it's a number just to keep the, uh, keep the comparison, uh, you know, consistent across time horizons. We started, let's say I, we started in 2011, even before the, and the regulations and everything came out. So it started with a with a with a hypothetical number of ten lakhs, and then mm -hmm. the assumption in that model portfolio has been we are not adding cash to it, because mm -hmm. what happens is you add cash to it, and then there is XIRR, and then all kinds of you know <laughs> acrobatics yeah. I have to do right. So I just kept mm -hmm. it simple. I said, assume a static portfolio, start with ten lakhs, and we just do so the point which you are making right. It's a fix. There is no inflow and outflow from the portfolio which I'm sharing to my subscribers. But that's not life, right? All of us are kind of, you know, have flow, inflow, cash flow coming in. We are putting money in. So what I tell is people to rebase their number based on that number. Like let's say 5% of this is, uh, is, uh, is on this particular total size, right? Look at your own personal portfolio and rebase it to that 5%. Again, uh, if ideally, you know, you would want to, you want to manage it in a slightly different way, but very honestly, I've not found a, 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 a you know, like a, a, a better, because if you, if you, different individuals coming in at different times, right? So let's sure. say you add 20 lakhs and somebody else 30 lakhs. How do you, how do you achieve that consistency of performance, right? right? For, I, I, for representative Before I ask the right? question, I have probably right. had an idea that there is no right answer or there is no perfect way to do this. Right. But just the thought around correct. this it, and how do you manage correct. this is... Correct, correct. No, no, that's a, that's a thing. Correct. I've always wrestled with. You have a very good point and subscribers keep asking me. What I ended up taking a few decisions in the beginning was I want to keep the, the, the performance tracking as simple as possible. So start with 100 and don't assume in and out because that will not... And very simply say uh, the dividends get reinvested in into the model portfolio. This is the, sure. mon the money I started with. It was invested in these stocks. These got sold. These got bought. This dividend came in. It was reinvested. So then I can I can truly say that otherwise you can always take these uh, tricks, right? You can say I put extra 50% 50, 50 cash into this model portfolio in 2020 bottom. And then I started buying from there. And nobody will know for better for it. I took all of those equations. I said tw January 27th, 2011 is when we started. We started with an amount of a hundred and just you know, putting this and that's it. There is no time. Now, you know, if, if I, if I can put extra cash in my personal portfolio at the bottom of a crash, fantastic. The, the numbers are better, but you know, no such uh, extra benefit of hindsight or anything for the model portfolio. 
portfolio starts at 100 and just remains at that. So basically, just just to ensure that there is transparency and consistency of number. That's mm. that's what we ended up doing. But I think you are right. You know, you can if you can put extra cash at the bottoms. You know, it obviously should improve. It it should be a plus rather than a minus. That's that that's the way I'm thinking, right? Let's say you sure. you keep getting these inflows, right? Hold the inflow on the side. That's what I tell my subscribers, and then add to it when you know when you when we get more aggressive on the model portfolio. All right. So a lot of lot of part of the processes are pretty much okay, right? We have understood the buying. We have understood uh, evaluation right. and portfolio management, etc. Uh, selling is pretty much the part of it and you've probably covered it to some extent, which is uh, you are selling based on um, your, uh, you know, you, when, when the scale, I mean, when the scale of the position have gone beyond your limit, but I'm pretty sure you have other reasons to sell. So let's also note them down. Uh, so what are, why are the reasons you sell except for position balancing or, you know, any of that reason? Number one reason is if I, if, if I'm not able to get the, uh, uh, if I got something wrong, right? I mean, I think that's always right. You you end up buying something and the original thesis breaks, right? So that obviously is usually uh, the number one criteria. Second is um, if a uh, if I've and I've been guilty of this quite a bit. I, I I bought a stock and I then I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting for it to turn, and then that never kind of you know um, uh, materialized. So that's the second. So I've kept a threshold of now of two years that uh, if a position doesn't work out within, let's say, a year and a half to two years, let's move on, right? So that's maybe that's the second reason. So one, obviously, or if, uh, so one is thesis breaks. Second is doesn't work in two years. Position size. Uh, fourth is uh, 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 the management just keeps coming up with new excuses every time the performance is bad. Now there I have a much now smaller tolerance. I'll wait for one quarter, two quarters. If I just see new excuses coming every quarter for why the company is not performing, independent of where the stock is, what the price is, I'll just, exe- you know, I've I've kind of dropped that threshold big time. So that has been the reason why I have ended up getting stuck with positions for years at end before, you know, the thing turned around. And then, but I never sell because I have a view about, okay, this is going to happen to the industry. This is going to, not sorry, industry. This is going to happen to the economy, interest rates, market will crash, this, that. Uh, that I never do. So it's all, you know, individual uh, position specific that I, that I, you know, end up, uh, uh, end up doing it. So in that theme, majority of the time, it's the same thing with the value investors, right? So I'm, uh, a thesis break is there, position sizing is there, all the reasons which you mentioned. Hmm. Let There's me- one more thing. Yeah, let me yeah. add to that. So earlier yeah. I would I would never look at this, but now let's say a company uh, declares its uh, results, and independent of how the results are, let's say the market reaction is very violent, and when I say violent, as in like the stock really gaps down, right? They literally just crashes 20, 15, 20 percent for whatever reason. You know that has my attention big time. Earlier I would think. Oh, you know, I'm the smart guy. Nobody gets it. I'll just hold on to it. I'll be the brave guy. And, you know, I'll just stick around with it. <laughs> no. <laughs> After 20 years of doing this, I realized. And by the way, this has happened. This has, this has increased more now. It used to not happen earlier. I've, I, I, you know, you get nostalgic with age on these things, right? Uh, you know, the company would declare a bad result and nothing would happen. And then weeks and months will go by and around, say, you know, you can sit and mull over it, over your tea, coffee or whatever drink you want. Now, no such luxury now. If things don't work out now, a little bit of a drop and all that is okay. But if the if the stock really goes uh, bonkers, right? And I mind you, it's not in momentum. It's none, none of that stock, right? But the stock just mm-hmm. crashes. That gets my attention. I may not exit, but definitely, you know, I will. I will start thinking hard about it, and sometimes I may even start exiting. So that has, that has you know, changed again. That comes from the trader's mindset, if you may. It's interesting you said that. At this very moment, I am in one of such stocks, which is also. Uh, I mean, before it fell that much, it was probably my second highest position. Now it has reduced only because of the fall. And I'm mm. pretty much doing the same thing which you're which you're saying. So I can appreciate the point which you're mentioning. Uh, yeah. But then let me put a bit more, uh, what do you say, tangibility to the whole concept of thesis not working, right? It's a very common thing we hear from everybody. Thesis like everybody working. says that thesis. thesis. What yeah, else? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I sell out when my thesis is not working. And, and, 
at in the same breath we also say that we don't know right uh, we don't know a lot about lot things a uh, judgment could be wrong or delayed mm-hmm. and we can't time things and all those things are there mm-hmm. and then we say you know i want to judge my thesis is not working let me mm-hmm. uh, uh, let me put you a construct which which has happened to me at least sometimes is that we have decided zero down on the few points i want to look at right which you also mentioned priority points which affects the business and the performance of the business uh, those points are not really doing the way i expected to but the price is doing great right uh, the price is doing fine the stock has done really well despite the thesis not playing out and the thesis not mm-hmm. working out uh, in that case you're wrong on your thesis but you are in momentum uh, have you changed your viewpoint there are you going to oh, write yeah, the yeah, thing i've changed completely so one thing which i have uh, and i i think the, uh, this gentleman called ashwathan damodar and i am sure you know mm-hmm. you would have all of you guys yeah, would have heard about it uh, i liked a few post of his right he is a he's he's an academic you know lot into value and he's made this good point right like he wrote a very long post around it like value investors have a chip on their shoulder and they want to do it in this way and that way and you know they made a religion out of it so i kind of completely went 180 on that i mm-hmm. you know i have i've come to like when i look at the numbers we mr dhawan has posted right on his website and i look at other momentum investors mm-hmm. i mean the results are there to see like why why do we have to get religious about it so if i if i see this is happening Hmm. Uh, the first thing which i will do is i know my thesis is not working but you know and so it has moved from a point where it's no longer a value play maybe it's a momentum play so i then i'm thinking a different time horizon then i'm saying you know what this has become like a trade and there is nothing uh, you know um, uh, wrong about it but now think of it like a trader if you may right yeah. so think of it like a momentum stock and i don't think of it that you will hold this for 3 years and then you know, this will happen and that happen now be ready to exit at a moment's notice and sometimes i will even, even alert my subscribers sometimes you know it it's tough to it's very tough to and this is a point where uh, public versus private investors you know i think private investors have an advantage because you can keep flip flopping and you can change your thought process but when you're doing it for your subscribers if you bring in all these values uh, all these points what they will say is are this bhaiya aap kar kya rahe ho like what exactly is going on you for yesterday you said this was a value stock now you're talking momentum then you're talking trade i mean ye total khichdi hai to you know <laughs> yeah, so, imagine getting but, a mail that you know uh, i bought this for great management quality great business great everything but uh-huh. unfortunately now it's a momentum stock and momentum. not a business like, you know, stock and anymore. and uh, uh, punit uh, you would and manish i know have sometimes you know put on his twitter and we have seen right people this is the other thing which i have seen people will come up with these huge stories me included right yeah. Yeah. and then we get stuck in these stories like that i think that yeah. is the biggest problem when we do fundamental investing right we get stuck in all these stories fantastic yeah. management you know we'll go till 2050 and all that and then what happens you know we drink our own cool aid right yeah. we'll get yeah. so stuck in the story then and then uh, that that story may or may not play out and then what do you do like there are all these funds in the us there are some of these funds in india they sell based on stories right and what happens when the story goes bad like you are a you are a you are a technology fund you are a saas fund now what happens when the saas fund go, when the saas sector goes down what yeah. do you tell your investors oops sorry the story is no longer you you double down and that's it that's the the fastest way to you know to yeah. to lose money so i have kind of realized that when the story changes if you tell subscribers you tend openly they get upset a lot of times people do get upset that you know why are you changing your mind but you know i think that's a strength that's not a weakness so uh, you're right so in this case if if the stock is doing well and all that i know my thesis is broken but uh, you know paisa ban raha hai so you know let's let's stick around for a little while and when you make money everybody is happy today in the morning me and puneet were having this precise discussion and we concluded that bar or buy at any price uh, is is actually functional equivalent of momentum investing only but the only difference is that when their stock hits they have to narrate a story correct <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually dangerous no you 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 you're bang on people talk about asian paints and all that like are boss what are you talking of Mm-hmm. I, I, the only reason why i am able to say something is i worked and i saw that company from very close quarters fantastic company but don't say 2050 may this will happen that, see that that is the other danger part right dangerous part of it you you do this bap investing 
you're doing momentum but you're not following momentum all the way right you're doing you're doing the entry part of it you're not doing the exit part of it you're going to kill yourself and your investors because you will you can't change your story quickly you will allow the stock go down 30 40% the momentum guys have moved on and gone to some other other new stock and you're still stuck holding the bag so i'm saying i i empathize with the public investors who do it because you know story sells right if you if you if you muddle your story it will not sell so in that sense you know it's not that people are evil or anything but how are you going to uh, gather assets like i mean i know i do it on the side we have not chased assets or anything of that sort but hmm. if you're if you're if you if you're into the story business uh, you can't change it so quickly we've seen that happen in with, with these various etfs in in the us right story change so but go ahead sorry punit so there is i think a cognitive dissonance element along this right so in some cases and well many value investors they tend to say in in one in the in the same breath you will hear two contradictory statements which is uh thesis is wrong and market is usually right uh and mm-hmm. i i exit when mark thesis goes wrong and in in the same wisdom somebody at some place will give that we should listen to the market because market is a collective wisdom of mm-hmm. lot of lot got of it, investors uh and in in some cases what i have seen is that uh, my thesis so most of the time value investors are betting on this very simple thing that the thesis is right and eventually the price and the and is wrong. will yeah it will mm-hmm. converge to some extent uh my market is even if you're not market is judging right the business the, then you're talking about valuation continuation of that journey and everything else so it's mm-hmm. not always market wrong they are also betting on continuation of the uh, business momentum but uh, on some cases when specially the point is thesis right and market wrong element uh, often it has happened that the price has moved much before the thesis points which we are thinking of actually materialized right and that is precisely where uh, when you enter and price moves and your thesis is not moving moving out of the position is actually a very uh, stupid uh, dif- i mean it's a very v- weird position to be in i mean this is where the learning that market is, has a huge tendency of being right is where you should think of that okay maybe the market is looking at those trigger changes much before they actually play on the ground and maybe i'm still correct, right correct. and i should still hold on to the position so not only momentum ho gaya uh i'm just saying that the whole point technical is that maybe the trigger will come later so why it's why sell out technical analysis yeah, yeah technical so i i know what you know, <laughs> i i can i can i can almost see and hear the gears turning because i have i have been i have been thinking all on the same lines for the last maybe 3 years now and and i saw it happen with some of my positions where the market got it bang on and the numbers and the fundamentals came at a much much later standpoint so uh, although i don't i don't uh, uh, practice it to that extent Uh, a lot of investors i see use this whole technical plus fundamentals right and i think there is merit to it again how ki how do you blend it again i i don't have a, a good idea about it but i think that's where you're coming right at what point so for the way i'm thinking is all, these are all different data points right uh, there is a momentum aspect there's uh, the how traders are looking at it there is technical there is fundamentals hmm. it's hmm. it's uh, at least my uh, my conclusion as of today is that it's a question of what weightage you want to give uh, at that point of time for that stock in that context so it's very difficult to be formulaic in that sense i could be looking at a company i'll give maybe i'll give two two extreme examples i could be looking let's say at a company which um, has a very so let's say like an hdfc bank or something again by the way i don't hold it but i'm just making it as an example so i would be looking at that company and saying very high quality consistent performance this and that and uh, i'll give it a little more you know weightage on the on the fundamental standpoint and i will say you know if the market is getting it a little wrong i know selling it off etc etc i'll buy it i will wait on it because the numbers will eventually catch up so uh, again I have to have a lot of patience it's like what when like by the time itc became a meme stock you know it is something like that right who know which stock will become a meme stock right but mm-hmm. at least you know the numbers will catch up and i can give more weightage to the fundamental aspect but there are some stocks which are so volatile more than the fundamentals maybe there are other variables which i should look at maybe i should look at the momentum aspect of it maybe there are technical aspects i should look at it 
and and then there are then there are some stocks where the fundamentals actually are are more or less un, unknowable or maybe you know it's very tough like for example if you're buying a very highly cyclical metal stock fundamentals you know you you will be, by the time the fundamentals come come through the story is all done so maybe fundamentals should get much lower weightage than some other approach so i am kind of now thinking that it's like a a toolkit right which tool do you pull out for which stock in a, in a specific context and that's 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 my thought process currently right so no standard way just pull these different tools out and start applying them and see okay earlier i used to have just this value tool right hmm. stock cheap below a certain point buy and then sell and then exactly the point you mentioned right stock appeared cheap the moment, the, the 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 fundamentals appear decent but the stock started kept crashing and then i had no no tools tool in my in my uh, in my toolkit to evaluate it on any other parameter and and that's how i'm thinking right like bring all these tools in and think of it from a different angle again weightage you know which one we will use in what manner you know i think it it varies by context and stock yeah brilliant point so uh, yeah i mean so process wise i think we are pretty much covered uh, see uh, i'll just give you a context of why we asked all these questions right majority of the time first sure. of all no no amount of a couple of hours are not good enough to understand everything around what the kind of working we do so uh, when we were restarting the podcast we had a thought that you know a lot of time of uh, podcasting goes into background building and all that kind of stuff and we decided that this time around not, none of that sort uh, unless and until it's really important to the context or it's not available in the market and we'll go straight to the straight to the Process. investment processes and yeah you know figure yep, it out yep. and even then i still think that uh, you know we should do more uh, one larger picture session and then one more deep dive into certain deep nuances dive. correct actually, correct yeah, and that that will be even more yeah. important to uh, get so on. let me so you're saying punit let me share one one very one very um, uh i think i would not i i won't call it inside but something which kind of i came across a few months back very good uh way of thinking about about investing there is this gentleman and i can maybe share the link at a later point this gentleman uh you know he talks about learning in different contexts it's more on i mean i'm a you know i'm i'm you know i'm a big proponent of figuring out you know how to learn better so there mm-hmm. is this whole thing around uh wicked domains right uh these are ill structured problems in wicked domains right it's like a very interesting sounding phrase but what it means is ill structured problem is where you know don't even understand the structure of the problem right like for example right in our in our schools and everywhere we go to you know we are asked a question okay what is 4 plus 2 and you you know what the question is and you can come up with a straight, straight uh, answer investing does not have a clear problem defined and uh, the wicked domain part of it is basically you don't get immediate feedback so this gentleman he talks about uh, you know how do you learn in situations where the problem is not structured and the feedback is is very you know it's very delayed right which, which is what investing is and you know he talks about you know games and i know both me and manish once played poker also and you know that's a, 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 a recent obsession of mine that is a partly a structured problem in not a wicket domain but you know uh, investing is so what this gentleman you know long story short what this gentleman said was the best way to learn in such domains is by case study method like right. look at companies because it's you know people talk about this formula and that method and that but if you are going to do this you have to and there is this whole craze around mental models but what i found is that you know unless you know the context mental models are very tough to apply i mean i found i i started looking at it and then kind of gave up because you know if you don't know the context how, you can't go through 150 mental models and what do you do with it but i found this case study ben- method to be very beneficial so i think i where i'm coming from is the your second point right that uh, whenever i look at somebody's uh, uh, you know idea or my own idea what i will do is i have i i'll take that particular idea out and i will i will go through the same process which you're going through how was the buy done how was this uh, the scaling done you know what was the sell criteria and how does it match with the approach i have now and you know what are the triggers and and what is the context so i think that's a very good point right i think i've i've started doing that and i've started making notes of my own right where i am looking at my own prior success failure somebody else's prior success failures and just creating sort of my own personal case studies okay what went wrong so what it, went right i mean if you're up to it's it now we'll do it again i mean we'll we'll uh, get into a session where 
we'll go into case studies and probably talk more specific processes around yeah. if you're up to it and you're willing to yeah, share yeah. it it will be a great session to have uh, manish you had a question uh, no i think uh, during the conversation uh, rohit answered it already so perfect uh, perfect but, but this so, will be fascinating this uh, discussion of case studies can be another session in itself yeah yeah so uh, i mean absolute great session rohit i'm uh, you know parallelly keeping a eye on the time and watch <laughs> there and i i don't want to stretch it way too much uh, but it was a great pleasure talking to you again we're catching up after a long Same long here. time uh, really yep. good to Same get here. the insights we'll again get in touch uh, later on for other things but uh, absolutely brilliant for the listeners probably they'll take away a lot of nuggets which generally gets untalked or unnoticed you know in the whole wise gyan world which we live in uh, some of the some of the uh, applicable nuggets go get lost in the in the middle of those sure, so sure. thank you so much for your time rohit thank you uh, thanks panit mohin yeah thanks great for your thanks, time thanks panit thanks for having me yeah rohit yeah. it was a pleasure having you uh, really appreciate it thank you thank you mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully